The end of The Last of Us Episode 8 is one of the most emotionally intense sequences I've ever seen. Both Ellie and David and their scene, and then the scene that follows with Ellie and Joel, there is so much nuance to the performances and the directing, but there's also so much setting the scene up throughout the episode. And this episode, by the way, as our final steps before the finale, is at an incredibly important junction in the story. Buddy boy. The climax to Ellie's arc is partly in the finale, but this dark, horrible, agonizing moment of triumph can even call it that, Buddy boy. is basically part one of her climax also. Buddy boy. Okay, Ellie, we get it. We'll start by explaining Buddy Boy. Okay, I'm actually serious though. I think this is actually pretty important. What is this gag that appears very conspicuously at the beginning of the episode? It's not like it doesn't fit. It's just a weird thing for her to say. So what does it do? What is Ellie expressing here? How is this joke functioning for the audience? And yes, just to be absolutely clear here, even stupid little jokes like this can be incredibly important. They are written to feel like throwaway lines, but this one in particular, it is crystal clear to me that this is intentional. So at its most basic, it's a joke. It makes us laugh, but that already is a subtle mindset switch. We hear Buddy Boy, we laugh, or we roll our eyes, and that shifts us into joke mode. And joke mode is very different from drama mode. We are sitting back and laughing, or whatever, even if it doesn't actually make us laugh, the story has signaled us to put our guard down. So you went from teacher to preacher because what if rhymes. It's like, okay, Ellie is saying dorky stuff, stuff that makes her feel tough, and it's kind of working to be honest. She sort of got this under control. We stop evaluating whether we should actually still be concerned about her safety here, because that's what the show is signaling to us by putting in a joke here. And think about the goals of the scene, the goals of the story at this point. David is being introduced to us as this ambiguity. We're trying to figure out whether or not we can trust this new character, and we do know this is the last of us, and people are kind of wild. And we probably should not trust anyone. But that said, what data do we have so far? Well, at its most basic basic level, David seems like a nice, agreeable guy. He's not projecting any kind of aggressive or wild energy at all. Also, we know he has a lot of responsibility for a community who's like actually suffering. They are starving, so his goals are virtuous. He is trying to help a bunch of innocent, starving people. And even still, he's willing to be helpful to Ellie. His community doesn't have much clearly, but as soon as the straight opportunity comes up, he's happy to make a fair trade. He offers Ellie exactly what she needs, despite his community probably not having much of it either. But wait, hold on just a second. Maybe this guy has ulterior motives. Maybe he He's hiding something. Bring back two bottles and a syringe. It's not code, James. Nope, seems like this guy has nothing to hide. He's honest, he's being really open even when he doesn't have to. Is this some weird cult thing? Uh... Well, you sort of kind of got me there. I am a preacher. We even do have a couple scenes of him where he's almost alone, and he's still not saying anything too wild. It all feels pretty normal for someone in his position, someone in his situation. So are we really supposed to be suspicious of the nice guy preacher who wants to help us and is just trying to feed his community? I mean, fine. Sometimes religious characters in situations like this do give us the creepy vibes, but we already kind of addressed that with a cult line. But just pretty standard Bible stuff. The way he says that doesn't even seem like he really takes it too seriously. It's just a thing to keep himself and his people hopeful. That seems fine, right? So it's hard to imagine anything we're missing here. This is a chance encounter. This guy's a total stranger. We don't know him. There's no crucially relevant backstory we're forgetting, right? Before that, I was a teacher. Math. No, 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 not like that. Although math teacher does seem pretty tame. No, I mean, think back to like the last episode. Anything I should be remembering from that? And no, I can't think of anything. Granted, almost the entire thing was a flashback. So maybe there's something I should be thinking about that happened before that? But man, I can barely remember anything that far back. It was so long ago. Okay, well, one thing I do remember was that they introduced some other new characters, and I was actually super suspicious of them because, as I said earlier, it's the last of us, people are wild. But it turned out one group was just a nice old American Indian couple, and the other group was family, and they were all about being peaceful and sharing stuff on their little Wyoming kibbutz thing. And also, even the episode before that, the new suspicious people turned out to be good. So all new characters are good, right? That's the takeaway, obviously I'm being simplistic. But my point is we have all these reasons why David seems like a good guy. He is friendly, he's helpful, he has virtuous goals, etc. And then... Also, buddy boy, buddy boy, buddy boy. Ellie has all the power in this situation to almost a comical degree. She's being totally dumb and dorky in this awkward teenage attempt to project confidence, and there's nothing these guys can do because she's pointing a gun at them, and that's the end of it. So add that to the list. Even if he was a threat, David has no power in this situation. And also, as if we didn't already get enough out of this dumb little gag, who the heck actually says buddy boy? What does she think she is, a 1930s mobster? This kind of sounds like bad guy lingo, and I 
think that's intentional. What do we know about David and his flock at this point? They've lost people, they're starving, they're in a pretty hopeless spot, they're on the brink. And now here comes Ellie, who we're also obviously sympathetic to, but she's basically holding up these poor townspeople. She's not planning on sharing any of this elk at all, even though there's literally more meat than she can physically carry. It's kind of mean. It definitely makes me feel sorry for David and the townspeople. So that also makes us a little less suspicious of David, because we're kind of the bad guy in this situation. So I just want to impress upon you from a writing perspective. Look at all of the setup they did to make us unsure whether or not to trust David. It is beautiful. They attacked our suspicion from every angle you can think of. They are out here ripping out red flags left and right. Everyone watching this at some point here is either going, okay, I guess we can trust this guy, or at least I still don't trust him, but I can't explain why. And this is Ellie's experience. This guy gradually appears more trustworthy to her, and even though at this moment we find Ellie at her most uptight and anxious for good reason, she's starting to relax a little bit. And it's because of this mountain of evidence that this guy is a friend. He's safe. I'm safe. What I need to be afraid of. And then, in an instant, this happens. He was murdered by this crazy man. And get this, that crazy man was traveling with a little girl. You see? Everything happens for a reason. James, lower the gun. Oh, sh**. I've made a huge mistake. This is something I talk about a lot, but when you want to create a big moment in your story, what you're often looking to do is to create an experience of emotional change. We feel emotions most strongly when they change, and the type of change we feel the strongest isn't 0 to 100, it's negative 100 to positive 100. It's the journey between extremes. And you feel it most strongly if you concentrate the entire journey from one extreme to the other into a moment, into a single instant if possible. And they pull it off so well here with David. One moment, we're safe, we're on top of the situation, we are in control. Control, and the next we realize we are inside the mousetrap already. We were totally ignorant of what the situation even was, and David has been in control this entire time. If you've ever heard the classic Hitchcock time bomb example, this is an interesting variation on that. If you've never heard of this before, the scenario is you have a scene with a bomb in it, and here's a clip of Hitchcock explaining the two options of how to do the emotional content of that scene. Four people are sitting around a table talking about baseball, whatever you like. Five minutes of it, very dull. Suddenly, a bomb goes off. What do the audience have? Ten seconds of shock. Now take the same scene and tell the audience there is a bomb under that table and will go off in five minutes. Well, the whole emotion of the audience is totally different because you've given them that information that in five minutes' time that bomb will go off. Now the conversation about baseball becomes very vital because they're saying to you, don't be ridiculous, stop talking about baseball, there's a bomb under there. You've got the audience working. What The Last of Us is doing with David is the third option. And this is something that works when we're already firmly in a type of story that has given us expectations. The third option is you show us there is nothing under the table. You show the characters knowing there could be something there, so they look and they can't find anything. But then also we know what type of story it is, so them not being able to find anything doesn't make us feel better at all, it makes us feel worse. We're not about to let ourselves think that there's no bomb, but then on the other hand we're like, well where is it then? Super Eyepatch Wolf has a fantastic video about this exact device as seen in The Shining movie, instead of limiting our perspective as horror often does, we're almost shown too much in order to gaslight us. What are you so afraid of? Look at all these wide angles. There's nothing here. Same thing with David. Nothing to hide. Why are you so afraid? I am but a simple shepherd, trying to be a good, helpful person. And as we all know, shepherds never have any wild backstory. And also look, you have a gun and you made the audience laugh so they let their guard down. There is nothing to be afraid of. All out the window in two seconds. Incredible execution. So what's the point of all this? This episode is all about putting our protagonist to the test by switching their roles. Joel is our story's protector, Ellie is our story's protectee. Episode 8, Ellie is our Joel, and Joel is our Ellie. And so far what we've talked about is what this opening scene does for David. This, what I'm talking about now, is what the scene is doing for Ellie. Our starting point here is Ellie's naive, childish version of what she thinks it means to be the Joel of the relationship. Being a Joel is about pointing the gun. It's about acting tough, having that stone-cold cowboy affect, and it's about talking tough Buddy boy. and to show just how naive she is. We don't just show her failing at Joel role. We don't like show her firing at someone and missing. We don't show her getting overpowered. We show her failing 
in the most comprehensive way. On a practical level, she threatened someone and then sent them back to their village where she should know that Buddy Boy could just get reinforcements. She should know that Buddy Boy could sneak up on her when he comes back. She should know not to put her back to the door. And she and we both know that of course the random people who attacked us like five minutes ago probably live close by. And we should totally be afraid that we might run into them. How in the world did Ellie think she was safe here? David is even fine letting her go because she blurted out that she's anchored to a sick guy somewhere close by. What were you thinking, Ellie? So, what's the logical progression here? Ellie has to learn what it truly means to be Joel. She has to experience the pain, the fear, the void, all of which is integral to Joel's character, but there's a lot that Joel does, there's a lot about who he is, that somewhat subconsciously, it's just his personality, but also consciously sometimes, he hides from her. She hasn't really seen what it actually means to be Joel. For a lot of it, there's no way she really could see it. So this prospect of Ellie really needing to assume the Joel role for real in a non-naive, true way, this is how an episode that is already full of challenges becomes total disaster. Because Ellie is not Joel. Ellie is small and weak, Ellie is female, and Ellie is a child. She cannot be Joel. And what she is gives her a completely different set of challenges compared to Joel. And that makes every step of this for her so much darker, so much more dangerous, in ways that are hard to even articulate. This is the truly horrifying part of this episode. It is so intense. And it drags the audience into such a black hole of emotions. And I can't really do justice to what's being communicated in all the nuances of the scene here, all the nuances of Bella Ramsey's incredible performance. That's just not how these kinds of emotions work. They don't translate to words. This is communicating psyche to psyche directly. And any descriptions just can't really get there. But that's never stopped me. Of course I'm going to try anyway because that's what I do. So first of all, I think this is important. We start out with Ellie doing something pretty smart. She doesn't have a weapon. Actually, I should really go back to this, which is the same thing. <laughs> This is really smart. Ellie has made a lot of progress since being just a brain dead, I'm gonna charge at Joel even though I'm the savior of humanity. Let's step on all the mushrooms. Let's not kill the zombie kid, dumb teenager. She still may not be Joel, but she's smart, she's capable, she's resourceful. Even when she has no weapon, she finds a way to create a chance for herself. Best case scenario, David runs out of the room because of the fire, and then she gets to escape as well. If not, maybe someone will see the fire and come and see what's going on, open the door. It's risky, but it's a good plan. And she's really quick, she just goes for it immediately. That's great. And then, when none of that materializes, she has to take a chance of fighting him. So she does find a weapon, she tries to do a surprise attack. She even aims for the right spot according to the Bill the Butcher school of killing people with knives. This is a kill. So she makes some pretty smart choices. That is important. Ellie does everything she should in this situation and she has to watch it all not matter. That is a different level of powerlessness. It is so much scarier to have tools that don't work than to not have any tools at all. Whether it's the feeling that this means something is wrong with me, I can't blame the situation itself as much anymore, or just the feeling that it's not fair. I did my part and the universe just didn't listen. It doesn't care and I'm still about to get assaulted and then chopped up and put on the stove. I think that powerlessness combines with the inherent powerlessness and terror a person feels when they're about to have violence of the worst kind done to them. And all of that is expressed right here. Don't be afraid. The first scream feels kind of like a normal scream. It's fear and trying to muster up more strength to escape. It's I cannot let this happen. And then the screaming changes. Don't be afraid. It's no longer I can't let this happen to me. It's I know what's about to happen to me. It's the world is ending. And yeah, I know it's post apocalyptic already. But honestly, spoilers for Arcane. Come on, you should know it's coming by now. Honestly, the last time I heard this kind of screaming crying was this scene in episode three. <laughs> That was also my world is ending. This is about way more than the pain I'm going to feel. It's way more than the anticipation of the experience about what's about to happen to me. What this is, is the one thing that cannot happen is about to happen. This is reality has turned its back on me. Nothing will matter after this. That is the feeling, not the actuality. And of course, this isn't what actually happens to Ellie. She does keep fighting and she manages to turn the tables. But this scene is going in that direction. And that is the first big emotion that we dwell on, which is is necessary to understand the next big emotion, which is what Ellie is feeling and what we're feeling as she kills David. I want to rewind two episodes for just a second, because this scene really requires a precise understanding of who Ellie is. I want to talk about this moment. So don't tell me that I'd be safe. 
say it for somebody else because the truth is I would just be more scared. And I think you can even go back to that first scene with Joel. This isn't actually as brain dead as it looks. Not if you think about what Ellie actually wants, what she sees as her most vital need in life. As odd as it sounds, she doesn't care about being in danger. She cares about feeling afraid. Her deepest need as a human being is to not have that feeling of fear. That's why she would rather surprise attack a random man she should guess can easily overpower her. It's why when Marlene gives her back her backpack, what does she immediately do? As if a little knife is going to matter that much when she's staring down a badass revolutionary in a compound full of badass revolutionaries. But no, anything to chase away that terrible feeling. Actually anything, literally. Even if it means putting myself in more danger. Even if it means putting myself in new situations that will also make me feel afraid. This is so core to who Ellie is that she can't even think that far. This is the only thing she cares about. And you have to remember, this girl is an orphan in a post-apocalyptic world. We don't know much about her upbringing, but she lives in a world where there is a lot of things that make you feel afraid. That is the experience of this world. She's never had anyone to protect her. She's never had anyone to tell her it's going to be okay. She has never had anything in life but herself to chase away that terrible feeling desperately, irrationally. However she does it, it's all down to her. And if she doesn't do it in a world like this, that feeling is just going to stay and it's going to cause the worst pain. Ellie is terrified in this final scene with David. She manages to find the cleaver and she uses it on David and she kills him and she still doesn't feel safe. And he's dead and she still doesn't feel safe and she still doesn't. And she still doesn't. She is so afraid in this moment that it's far exceeded anything having to do with this person. And all of her actions are directed not at safety, but purely escaping that painful fear that is taking over her life right now. And we see how tragically corrupted this mechanism inside her psyche is. It's twisted her reality principle so much that she will stay in a burning building to hack an already dead corpse into pulp. That is how afraid she is. David is dead, but David wasn't the threat. Ellie is fighting the world in the scene. And it's not clear if she succeeds. This doesn't look like she's conquered her most unwanted feeling and now she can relax. It looks like her mind just goes blank at some point while she's doing all this. And we get brainstem Ellie stepping in and forcing her to stand up and get out of the building away from the fire. Okay, let me pause for a second here. Let's come up for air a bit. Okay, deep breath. This scene is so intense. Let me do a little story time to set up the next thing I want to talk about in this scene. Once upon a time, I was in the Grand Canyon with my friend. And it was a sunny day. And then, all of a sudden, craziest thunderstorm ever out of nowhere just like in minutes. It's sunshine to literally lightning striking nearby, rain coming down in sheets, wind so strong it's physically blowing us off the trail, and then of course as soon as we get back to the start of the trail we climb out of the canyon. That moment the whole storm just immediately stops and it's sunny again and I remember walking like a zombie through this little parking lot where people were pulling up and getting out of their cars and they were all fresh faced and bright eyed and innocent, totally oblivious that there had been any storm at all. And meanwhile, me and my friend were lurching past them like corpses, soaked to the bone. It looked like we had jumped in the ocean and they were just staring at us like, what the f*** happened to you? And we were staring back at them like, yeah, go ahead and stare, you ignoramuses. You will never know our pain. <clears throat> okay, so that is what I associated to in this scene. The way this is shot, Ellie is coming out of that building and she's out. And the abrupt change in scenery combined with how relatively uninjured she looks, she doesn't even look exhausted, probably because of the adrenaline, but it's like the outside world doesn't reflect her inner experience experience at all. It doesn't reflect what just happened in any way. No one will ever know or ever understand what just happened. In moments like these, it almost feels like the world is attacking your sanity. Like, look, everything's okay. You're safe. It's bright. You're healthy. Show me. Prove it. You won't. Go ahead. Go ahead and point out what's supposedly still causing all this pain. What's that? You can't? Yeah, that's what I thought. It is a really complex emotion to convey, especially as this background sense, but so efficiently and effectively done here. And then this is brilliant. This episode's plan is simple and totally misleading. Joel is Ellie's protector. Forget the reversal of roles, apparently that's not working out so well. And by the middle of the episode, we kind of get the new plan here. Okay, I see. So Ellie is in danger, Joel is healed up enough to be mobile again. Let's see if Joel can reach her in time to save her. That is our little gambit. The race is on. And then, slowly, we realize crap, he's not gonna make it, is he? We are set up for this expected scene of Joel swooping in just in time to rescue Ellie, saving her from anyone who intends to do harm to her, and we don't get that. Joel doesn't get there in time. And terrible stuff does start happening. And Ellie ends up having to protect herself, and it's difficult, but she actually does it. She doesn't need Joel. Except, that is the twist. Joel is Ellie's protector, but like we said, safety is second on Ellie's list of priorities. There is something she needs way, way more than safety. And in that sense, Joel does does arrive.
arrive just in time to save Ellie. Not from bodily harm, nope, she can actually handle that herself. No, he arrives to save her from what she truly needs saving from, because she is still so afraid, and once Joel hugs her and tells her everything is going to be okay, that is how he truly protects her. This is a pattern that is all over The Last of Us. In my Ellie video, I talked about how the real harm this world inflicts on you isn't bodily injury, it's the non-physical wounds. Joel, but also we the viewer, are not afraid of Ellie getting hurt as much as we're afraid of her becoming Joel, because that is something that would be truly terrible. In my zombie video, I talked about how the story shows you the physical zombies, but the real zombies the show is highlighting is the humans. And it's the same with Ellie. This entire time, we're so concerned for her physical safety, but there's something much deeper she needs protecting from. Joel, he is not just a guardian, he's a parent. And that is something Ellie needs more than anything, more even than staying safe. And what this is communicating is that the human experience is so much more concerned with the intangible aspects of life over the surface level physical things. And this scene is clearly showing how much the intangible matters, both the bad and the good. And there's a sick truth here, not about this in specific, just about how stories work. We see this girl, this orphan, who really, really needs a dad, and we see this dad who really, really needs a daughter. And we get the barriers involved here, but we also feel like they're kind of illusions. Or at least we wish they were. We wish they didn't exist. We want to see these invisible barriers come down and stop preventing this perfect union of two people who really need each other. But that can't happen because this is a story, and stuff doesn't just work out in stories. Nope, in stories you need to earn good emotional stuff. We only get this father-daughter moment after going through the absolute emotional hell of this episode. Sick or not, that is how catharsis works. And it works. Oh man, it is so cathartic. We feel that hug so much. The way she tries to speak and then just gives up, she doesn't need to say anything. She just needs this. It's so beautiful. No sappy reunion, no big emotions, just the most meaningful emotion, which can only exist through this specific bond. She can protect herself, but this is the only person she can get parental love from. And right now she needs needs it, and right now she gets it. That is cathartic. Okay, time for some concrete writing tips to end this video. I see this episode as a masterclass in the relationship between villains and protagonists. Good villains create conflict, great villains are tests that generate copious amounts of tension while we wait and see if the characters are at the point in their development that we hope they are, that they need to be in order to advance the story. Can Ellie be a Joel? Can she be a protector? At the end of the day, Yes, she succeeds. Barely, but she gets Joel the help he needs. She keeps the bad guys away, or at least enough of them to make the situation manageable, and Joel survives. Can Joel be an Ellie? Can he bring humanity back into the life of a cold, empty shell of a post-apocalyptic killer? Yes, he succeeds as well. And can Joel be a Joel? Can he be a protector in a situation like this? And yes, he protects Ellie from what's truly threatening her, fear. And I think all this goes a level deeper. The intro itself, as we talked about, is the first test Ellie encounters, and this test she fails. She is too inexperienced and naive when it comes to people of this post-apocalyptic world. Ellie fails here and cannot protect herself. But remember, Joel also failed this test and could not protect a girl. Arguably also because he was too inexperienced and naive when it came to the people of this then new post-apocalyptic world. And admittedly, that's a bit of a stretch, but I think the similarity is present enough to make a meaningful connection between the trajectories of both characters after this initial failure. They both are going to do whatever they need to so that they never fail this test ever again, even if it does leave them wounded and empty as a result. And David is our vehicle crafted around creating these stakes, making these demands on character, and instigating these drives for development. He provides the post-apocalyptic complexity that will confuse Ellie and test her capabilities. He himself and his community sets those uneven odds that only the true drolls of this world can overcome. And Ellie's biggest obstacle is fear. And oh boy, is David designed to bring out her fear in every way possible. And also, Joel is at the stage where he has to not just assume the physical protective role of parent, but the emotional role as well. And again, it's David who renders Ellie into a state where that's exactly what she needs from Joel as well. Characters do develop in response to what they've been through, but also in response to what's demanded of them. Create villains that do not meet characters where they're at, but stand a little further down the road than your characters are right now. And make your characters need to develop almost too quickly to get far enough down that road to overcome their obstacles. And in that pressure to develop, let them fail sometimes, but then that's when you can make them pick themselves back up and rise to the occasion. Oof. Oh man, what an episode. 
I could talk about this episode forever. There's so much more I have thoughts on. Just to squeeze in a little bit real quick. The soil and green is people trope here was done really delicately. So if you're familiar with the trope, you saw a bunch of signs. And if you weren't, it was the satisfyingly shocking thing. And there were dots to connect and whatnot. The droll plot in this episode was just candy in like the best way possible. It was just droll being super droll. Still kicking ass even when he's like 90% dead. There are also some shortcomings in my opinion that are worth talking about. David went a little too insane murder creep a little too fast. I would have wanted a little bit more set of both with just how far gone he was and with this whole predatory thing he had with Ellie that he saw himself in her and leadership and all that on top of all the creepy stuff. Something that I liked about this episode, they didn't go too much into it, was just the treatment of cannibalism as a topic in a situation like this. It's a pretty juicy topic to explore the morality of because it feels so monstrous. It feels like there's like a lack of humanity going on or something like that or it's some kind of like moral slippery slope. I don't know man, I don't think David was really doing anything wrong until basically this moment. Killing people to eat them is over the line but keeping people alive by eating people who are already dead i don't see a problem with that that's my opinion and let me tell you the moment the actual apocalypse comes the moment i see even a hint of a zombie irl you can find me at the morgue eating my way through everyone i think it's perfectly reasonable and i think it's also perfectly reasonable to lie to everyone about it as well i think david was right to do that but that's just me let me know if you disagree i'd be curious to hear why but anyway i go a lot deeper into what i talked about today in these two videos specifically so i'm gonna leave those up here i started a discord for my patreon we got a great community brewing over there we're having discussions about stories we like and stuff we're writing we got people starting writing groups and helping each other out with creative projects. So check that out if you're interested. Shout outs to all the patrons, especially my new high tiers. Joseph Arena, Arena, Arenia, Cyrus Orion, Unconventional Gamer. Huge thanks for the support. Hope everyone enjoyed and thanks for watching.